We're back. This is Dave Vellante, and we're here live. This is day one of Oracle Open World. I am sitting in for John Furrier, who was driving up the Pacific Coast Highway, dropping off his son at uh, University of Santa Barbara, and uh, he'll be here this afternoon. I'm here with Stu Miniman and Jeff Kelly. Gentlemen, we've been hearing a lot about Oracle. Uh, we heard the keynotes this morning, Larry Ellison last night, announcing an in-memory database. One of the things, Jeff Kelly, we didn't talk about in depth was that in-memory database that was announced, it was really a response to SAP HANA, wasn't it? And some of the other trends that we're seeing in the industry. What's your take? Uh, absolutely, so essentially it's a, an in-memory database, so a little short on details, but an in-memory database that allows you to do some analytics and transaction processing on the same database, which is exactly what uh, SAP HANA is really designed for. So uh, I think certainly Oracle is, uh, you know, they, they continue to uh, respond to uh, market pressures, uh, SAP HANA being one of them. But of course also with the larger big data story, responding to the pressures as associated with the open source uh, big data movement around Hadoop and other NoSQL players, which we're going to have on later today. Folks like Datastax, and we'll talk a little bit about how they're uh, competing with Oracle and, and really trying to add a, a, a new element to the uh, database game. So there's an article in Silicon Angle that I, I just saw, uh, I think it was Burt Lattimore put it up, talking about how Clustrix and I think even IBM had come out and said, um, that, that Oracle's approach to in-memory is not the correct one, uh, that Oracle's doing a scale up, that the future is scale out. Stu, this is a big argument, the whole scale up versus scale out. We have this all the time. Um, clearly if you're Amazon, if you're Google, you're going to move into a, to a scale out. You've got the, the PhDs and the engineers to actually build a software-led layer that you can put on top of commodity infrastructure. But Stu, most enterprises don't have that capability. Most enterprises would rather buy a solution. They'd rather spend money on a solution to, to save time, whereas a lot of the, the hyperscale guys, they'll spend time with engineering time to save money. So what's your take on this whole scale out versus scale up thing? Yeah, yeah, Dave, exactly as you were saying, you know, not every customer necessarily needs to just continually scale. Uh, absolutely, if you look at the service providers of the world or the large customers uh, that act like a service provider, uh, they are growing and they have a growth profile where they need to keep adding and expanding, and what we don't want to have to do is every time I outgrow one box or one configuration, have to add that into my network and continually expanding and making it more difficult. We do want kind of seamless, fast growing, which is what scale out architectures really allow. Uh, for many customers though, a, a single box that they can grow inside is going to last them that kind of three to five years on a refresh cycle. Um, so the real thing we look at is, you know, some customers um, are going to be okay just buying that, that single, you know, box solution and upgrade the pieces of their stack as they go. Um, others what might need the scale out architecture and everybody is struggling with what do I do in-house versus what do I put in the cloud? Um, because that, that's really one of those discussion points is, you know, is IT a differentiator for my environment or should I just be getting it out of the, uh, you know, purview of my own people uh, so that I can trust somebody else uh, either for a specific application or for smaller companies it might even be my whole IT environment. So, a lot of times we're talking about in theCUBE about how uh, Larry Ellison has uh, Apple Envy, wants to be the iPhone of the enterprise, but so, what are the similarities and what are the differences between what <coughs> Apple's doing in software and, and, and engineered hardware, I guess, as well, uh, but particularly at Apple as a software company and, and Oracle? Jeff Kelly. Well, I think if, if you look at, uh, well, it's interesting, if you look at the iPhone, for example, obviously it's, uh, they've had a big refresh of the software, iOS 7, uh, but also re released some new hardware. Uh, but if you think about the things that make uh, the iPhone so attractive to, to a lot of consumers, is it's, uh, you know, it's simplicity, uh, it is, you know, it's elegance, uh, but there are some challenges associated with that. Uh, you know, for instance, it's expensive. You know, you're paying for all that pre-integration that took place. Uh, there's also some, you know, it's not as customizable as, uh, as an Android device. I mean, we all, everybody who's got an iPhone is familiar with you know, the new stand app, and the, uh, the stocks app, and others that you don't want to use, but you can't get off the iPhone. And, and similarly with Oracle, you've, you've got to accept certain realities when you uh, adopt their, their technologies, their converged systems. Um, so in that sense, you know, they are pretty similar, of course, uh, Larry Ellison and Steve Jobs were you know, close friends, and I think saw eye to eye uh, to a degree on this kind of uh, idea that hardware and software should be uh, pre-integrated and really built uh, together. Is the, let's, let's stay on this theme of mobile and, and consumerization of IT. You look at uh, the iPhone, totally integrated, Android is this, Android is almost like the windows of, of, of mobile devices, and now 
um, Microsoft has gone out and has bought a, a device maker and has gotten into the, to the hardware business. Google has done the same thing. Stu, is the analogy of the mobile marketplace and the trends that are going on in the market, are they applicable to the enterprise or are they just two totally different worlds? Uh, interesting question, Dave. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, uh, Scott Lowe, who, who writes for us at Wikibon, just wrote a piece uh, that, that just went out that you know, maybe Microsoft you know, should look at buying BlackBerry. They just bought Nokia. Um, and you know, when Microsoft first got into the surface, uh, I was really skeptical about Microsoft getting into the hardware business um, I, because so much of their business was driven through the OEMs. Uh, and I thought they really were putting Surface in place to try to incent people to adopt uh, you know, the, the Microsoft platform and that they would get HP and Dell and others to kind of drive that platform. So on the, uh, the analogy I draw on the enterprise side is when VMware launched their vCloud hybrid service, um, it, it really uh, you know, had a lot of pushback from some of the service providers um, because VMware is a technology supplier and has a huge ecosystem that uh, either sells uh, the, the licenses that VMware offers or builds solutions around them. So it, it is really tough for a company to span between them. Uh, the, the great example of who has done a good job of being able to kind of eat their ecosystem without uh, losing all of their partners is Intel. And Intel's one of the few that, that's been able to do that. You can buy Intel white boxes, but they still compete with them. We had SanDisk on earlier who makes it very clear uh, that they are a supplier uh, to many of the providers out there, but it's tough to be both a supplier and a competitor in that space, uh, and you know we, we've seen kind of mixed results depending on how you d deploy it. So we've heard a lot about cloud. Uh, we've heard, been hearing cloud from Oracle now for quite some time. Uh, all this t talk about the NSA and, and Prism has really heightened awareness of security and privacy. Uh, doesn't that bode well, Stu Miniman, for Oracle? Yeah, David, it does, because if we, if we look at, you know, this is not a story that's going away anytime soon. We've talked to a lot of CIOs, and security is all of a sudden, you know, one of the top priorities, and people are worried that if they go to a Google or a Microsoft or an Amazon, that they might be compromised. Heck, all of the encryption technologies that people are using in-house, they're all worried about whether there's a back door uh, that the government can see what's doing there. Uh, so, uh, you know, this all means that I'm more likely to keep things in-house and keep things under my control. And of course, that is where Oracle has a good play and the, the traditional infrastructure players, uh, you know, are less likely to be disrupted from the likes of Amazon. So do you think we're going to see uh, Oracle you know, putting some FUD into the market about this security question? That's uh, a really interesting perspective. I mean, if they've got a, you know, a lot to gain from this, um, Oracle is not above you know, stirring the waters a little bit and putting a little FUD out there. So, so, so definitely anybody that offered private cloud solutions has been saying for years that you can't trust the public clouds. And in many ways we thought over the last you know, 12 months that people had gotten beyond that. Uh, Amazon has their government cloud, uh, and there were solutions that are going out there. Uh, everybody's been testing in, in the cloud environments. I mean, Jeff, I know you watch all the big data environments that go out in the cloud, uh, but th there's definitely FUD out there, but there's reality that people are worried about, you know, what is the government going to see and where do I put things? Well, I agree. Uh, it's, it'll be interesting to see over the long term if this you know, the whole NSA scandal, if you will, it really uh, stifles innovation um, because the cloud offers so many things you can do, particularly you know, in the area that I cover, big data. Uh, it, it really, the cloud is going to be critical when it comes to things like the industrial internet. Uh, connecting uh, the you know the internal infrastructure of the country, the electrical grid, and other things with uh, healthcare and other uh, areas of that of that nature. And so, if if that kind of stifles investment in or uh, innovation around the use of cloud to enable industrial internet use cases, that would be uh, that would be unfortunate. So, I want to go back to the big data themes that we heard this morning. Oracle was really <clears throat> beating that drum oh, pretty yeah. hard. I mean, Jeff, to me, it's a total you know transformation of of the whole big data. Theme. I mean, last year we saw Oracle. Larry Ellison gave this big demo. He showed, a, showed, a, you know, he took the Twitter fire hose and he ingested the whole thing into, you know, Exadata or Exalytics. I can't remember which, which big big box it was, but it was, it felt kind of million dollar ironish. Mm -hmm. uh, and Thomas Curian today was more talking about a portfolio, which yep. I, again I think would resonate well to a CEO, or or a senior level CIO who's hearing all this stuff. Uh, about Hadoop and big data and unstructured data and data growth and data being the new source of competitive, competitive advantage. 
And then Oracle comes in and says, look, we got this portfolio, it fits with your existing legacy environment, uh, we can wrap a nice red blanket around you, here you go, and you can solve all the world's analytics problems. Um, why doesn't that play well? What's, what's the risk that customers face in going down that path? Well, I think the, the major risk, of course, is that you get locked into to an Oracle environment. Uh, and if innovation in the open source world kind of continues uh, at the pace we're seeing, uh, potentially you get left behind. Uh, I think, you know, obviously the other thing is it, it, it's going to cost you significantly more to invest in the Oracle's uh, big data products, solutions, architecture, what have you, than going out and, you know, spinning up a cluster on AWS uh, for Hadoop or, uh, you know, bringing in, uh, you know, buying a few machines internally and spinning up a cluster. Uh, certainly it's going to cost you a lot more. But again, Oracle is betting on that, hey look, the fear of lock-in, uh, you know, that hasn't stopped us from growing, <laughs> hasn't stopped our customers from investing us, in us, and they, they're betting that it's not going to stifle their big data play. So here's the conundrum. 50% of the customers that we surveyed in the Wikibon community said they were willing to risk lock-in to get uh, integrated function and simplicity. Uh, that was sort of a clear message. And only about 15% said that we are dogmatic about open source. Mm -hmm. So open source in and of itself and this is not a surprise to anybody, clearly is not the driving factor for customers. What is the driving factor is innovation occurs as a result of open source, and what you're saying, if I understand it correctly, Jeff, is over time, the open source community could catch up, will catch up, and actually will surpass sort of the proprietary vertically integrated stack and then extend value at a much lower cost. Is that correct? Absolutely, you look at the, uh, some of the work that, for instance, Hortonworks is doing on the Hadoop area uh, with Yarn and MapReduce 2, uh, you know, they are really pushing innovation in that, in, that, in that area and they're also offering a value proposition that's hard to beat. The software's for free, uh, you pay only for support. Um, they're starting to uh, integrate with other uh, providers of uh, data warehouse, database technology like Microsoft and Teradata, so they're trying to make it easier to integrate into your environment. Uh, but, you know, really, if you start, if you get locked into an Oracle uh, big data play, and you could potentially see the open source world and other other competitors zoom by. Uh, that said, you know, Oracle uh, is is not certainly they're not stupid. They're they're planning. Uh, you know, they have a good strategy around this, and clearly, there there's going to be some acquisitions in this space. And Oracle, I think, is going to be one of those companies to make some of those acquisitions. Um, so, you know, it's really I think their their play uh, around integrated systems that allow enterprises to start driving value from big data today, I think is going to play uh, pretty well with their customer base, um, and it's going to certainly uh, play well with a lot of uh, folks out there who are struggling right now to bring together all these open source technologies and haven't had a lot of success yet. Okay, well so same question on the hardware side, Stu Miniman. How long does it take for software-led infrastructure on commodity components uh, to actually catch up to the, to the VMAXs of the world? Yeah, uh, great question, Dave. It, it definitely, you know, th these kinds of transitions take a long time. Um, and as you know, we talked about earlier, uh, customer environments uh, in the enterprise are really looking for full solutions. So it really does take somebody to bundle all of those pieces together um, because most customers aren't going to be able to take, uh, you know, just you know, take software and buy their own hardware and wrap it all together, which is what we see Google do. Uh, you know, Google puts their entire configuration together. They did their own distribution in Linux and and put it all together. They've got you know all the PhDs to make that happen. There are interesting technologies out there uh, in both the storage space and in the networking space trying to disrupt them. But we usually measure those transitions in, in years or a decade or more uh, to be able to do this. So uh, you know, it, it, it's interesting to see on the you know the storage side we've been watching close, you know, EMC has their, their projects like Viper and Nile and what they're doing, but uh, you know, it's going to take a long time is basically what I'm saying, Dave. All right, Stu and Jeff, thanks for helping me out with this editorial segment. We're going to stay on this theme of Flash. Fusion IO is here. Ba interestingly enough, when, when EMC sort of landed its haymaker and announced that it was bringing Flash back into the uh, storage array, at the same time Fusion IO was working on a PCIe card and, and essentially shipped that product you know, right around that same time. Fusion IO is the leader in that market. Gary Ornstein is here. So keep it right there, we're right back. We're going to unpack what's going on with Flash at Oracle Open World. This is Dave Vellante, this is theCUBE. <laughs>